It's part of the themes of the exhibition and, and thinking about the last hundred years they have broken up into issues of preservation and, and landscape, communities, and, and publics, and sort of the, the different worlds Montauk has taken up. So Donnie mentioned what I do at Montauk and what my role is to oversee the arts program as well as the residency program. And, and I think the one piece I would add is when I arrived to Montalvo, Montalvo was in a, in a transit, transition, really moving from being primarily a concert venue and, and a wedding venue with an artist residency, hosted an artist residency since 1939, and, and moving into balancing that out to becoming an art center and what does that look like. And um, we, we started to take on themes of the day and, and that started in 2007. The last 18 months before we entered this centennial year, 2012, we looked at issues of sustainability. And they were really around sustainability of kind of not only our natural environments, but sustainability of our cultural environments and our cultural spaces. And how do you really make a cultural space vibrant? And how does that begin to shift kind of where if you're going to spend your time, how we're going to spend our time, how we're going to sort of start addressing our everyday lives in a different way. So I think that means jumping off point. <coughs> so as Donna mentioned, I'm the garden curator. Uh, there was no garden person here for forever, really, uh, before me. I've been here a couple of years. But I, I kind of like to tell the story. Uh, a board member called me out of the blue, and I, I left my estate work after 20 years and was kind of wondering what was next in my life. Um, and he called and said, would you be interested in being the head gardener at Montalvo? And I said, well, tell me more. And he goes, well, we're trying to fix it up and we need somebody to kind of prune the noses and pull some weeds and clean it up. <laughs> and I'm like, no, no, just <laughs> sorry, you didn't really know that. I said, yeah, I'm more interested in trying to develop something uh, special. Uh, if there's any interest there. So when they started a conversation, like, well, actually, there is interest because the place really needs a lot. So that was the start of a series of conversations. And we didn't even have a title for my job. Uh, and we finally came up with Garden Curator. Um, so here I am. Um, and I also like to tell a story that I got here, I couldn't find a hose or a shovel or anything. So there's this fabulous estate with so much potential and so much history, but really uh, this tremendous potential to develop, to, to develop something here. Um, and with the support of uh, a very vibrant uh, committee of committed folks, volunteers, and also the senior staff at Montalvo, we're beginning to make some moves here. And it's my goal uh, is to create a real garden destination that is both compelling from a historical standpoint, like the honor history of the place, but also uh, where it's kind of this, this cutting edge uh, sustainability model that is beautiful, interesting, educational. I want it all. So uh, I think Kelly and I have a lot of uh, overlapping ideas in that, that realm. We'd like to chat about more today. Back at you. <laughs> <laughs> I feel so legal <laughs> So, I think one, one more piece is really, as we began planning for this centennial year and thinking about our programs, it was really important for us that we, we take this moment to both honor the past, but also start the pointing towards the future. And what do we want to see happening at the moment? What do we want? How do we want to see the programs grow? How do we want to see the grounds change, evolve, and develop? Um, so I'm going to start. We've outlined our conversation with some images, certainly not all images. And we're going to start here. So I'm just going to go. Um, so the villa that we're in was built in 1912. It was established, as Donna said, by the late Senator James Duvall Theater. Um, Senator Freeland was a three-time mayor in San Francisco, but this was what James Obach, which he would say was his home. This is where he came to be at home to spend his time. It was his country home. I think Santa Clara County at that 
moment in time in 1912 was you know, vibrant agricultural land. It was rich, sort of lush resources here. We've, we've been deforested, you can see on the hillsides, but we were also filled with orchards and, and lots of fruit foods growing here. So this was very much what this valley was a hundred years ago. The senator himself <laughs> was an eccentric man. Here he is again, and he was over above Kathleen. And he uh, normally had, but when he was at Montalvo, he was, he was at play. He was resting. He was entertaining. He had, he had poets and musicians and, and visuals and politicians and dignitaries coming from all over the world to visit him and spend time here. Um, you know, the woman who would stay upstairs, Trude Atherton, would, would take sort of time to spend upstairs in the suite above. The house is built and sort of broken into suites where, where guests could come and stay. Gertrude Atherton loved pink geraniums. Therefore, he had his Italian gardens lined with pink geraniums. Um, but I think it's important just to remember sort of the nature of this man because this was a place to entertain, to enjoy himself and to have fun. He is right here by the swimming pool, which is currently our oval garden, and you'll see in another image. Um, it's the prime location for our weddings. The senator had an art collection around the grounds. I think today we have about 12 of his pieces remaining on the grounds. The pieces were brought to him and collected very much in a sort of classical manner. He was looking back to old Europe and bringing classical works onto the site and placing them around the grounds. Um, so there was always a tradition of having sculpture on the ground. He was always entertaining here. This was a place where he was entertaining soldiers. He was entertaining the friends, family, people were coming here probably was about sort of this gathering spot and festival, um, which it remains today very much a place. This is an image of um, Art Splash, and Art Splash is our annual open house. We've been doing it now this year. will be the third year, April 21st. And it's just a moment to open the doors, bring the community in. When the senator died in 1930, he left the property to the people of California. He left the property to the San Francisco Art Association with the request that it be used as a public park for the people of California. And to date, we're about 175 acres. We've got about two and a half miles of hiking trails. And we are a public park. We're open you know, 363 days a year. And, and people are allowed to come, spend time, and, and take my following in whatever way makes sense for them. So activating these spaces, I think we come collectively with what Dale and I are charged with. Um, the senator, this is 1930 when he left the property to the San Francisco Art Association. And San Francisco still today is a very far drop from Saratoga. And in 1930, I bet it was just light years away. And this is also, you know, right around the time of the Depression. So you have, you have the Art Association trying to figure out how to manage this property that's, you know, a couple of hours away and how to take care of it. And they, they established the artist residency here in 1939, but it was the late 40s where they really realized they couldn't no longer care for the property. And they tried to turn it back over to the family. And there was a group of folks from Saratoga who got together and really fought to keep this as, as an art center and as a public park for the people of California. And this group still today is incredibly active with them. Probably many members still living with us. And this was about the 1950s, and at that point it became a Montalvo Association. Now, it's your job. <laughs> So, um, trying to piece together the history of Montalvo as far as the grounds go, it's been an interesting challenge. One of the things that I kind of, after we started having conversations about um, me coming on board here, 
the way I tried to sell it myself is like we need to have some kind of grand vision, a master plan here. Because I could see that it was basically about 100 years of individual ideas kind of amalgamated together here where you can imagine this volunteer group doing this project and that volunteer group doing that project and individually with great intentions but overall it didn't reflect any cohesive vision uh, for the grounds and so yeah um, that, that we can go back can you go back to that? I'm sorry I just um, so very much shortly after this will um, and you can see how less treed it was. Uh, and anyway, the, the most I've been able to find personally on the history of one's home is uh, through pictures at the, the Bancroft Library in Berkeley. Um, and actually, our website, thanks to Nathan, who is somewhere around here, um, yes, and it has a lot of great pictures too. But what I kind of come to the conclusion, and I'm going to go talk about what we're doing right now to research this more, but is the gardens were on the way to becoming something really special, but they never developed fully because Senator Fema died in 1930. And so it's an interesting conundrum, like, as we want to restore the gardens, what are we restoring them to? Kind of an unfinished idea? Uh, maybe some areas were rather undefined, undeveloved. Other areas don't really even know what they were. So it's kind of a sleuthing type thing. And we uh, actually just this week finally have a signed contract with a uh, landscape architect, uh, Kathy Garrett, who will be developing a, a, a master plan with us. And she's a, a, a landscape, landscape historian, so she'll be doing some research and see what she can find. Part of my task and the bigger task of the community is really defining what we want on title to become as far as the grounds. So my own personal thought is, you know, there's not too many venues like this around, period, much less in the Bay Area. I mean, we have Filoli um, as one good comparison. That's really a world-class destination garden, or it, the garden itself, itself draws many, many thousands of people a year into it. And so I can imagine Montalvo becoming something like that, where the grounds themselves become a destination and an attraction. And then with the art component really being a vibrant community uh, vision here. So trying to balance that with also honoring the history, um, maybe we can move on now. Some of it's easy. This is the Italian garden, which is straight out, the center axis all the way down. And that's relatively intact. In fact, it's been restored uh, fairly well by volunteers. I guess the, the story goes about four or five years ago, you could barely walk through there. It was just this kind of bland and kind of scary. So, several, <laughs> seriously, several uh, volunteers really put their effort into uh, replanting it. Uh, there's no longer pink rains, but there's white roses. But some of the Italian cypresses were replaced, uh, citrus were replaced. So that's a pretty straightforward thing. Like no one's suggesting we change that. But if you go to the left of this axis, axis there's this kind of beautiful open space of uh, it's kind of a native grass lawn now with some fruit trees in it, a giant old avocado, a few persimmons. But it's kind of like, well, what's, what's this model be? So that's part of what the master plan is going to be looking at. Like maybe that high, the map that is a really great area to have a rotating uh, sculpture garden through there and really develop it. In fact, there are sculptures in there now, uh, but really bring that to a, a great level. Shall we go to the next? Uh... So this is a challenge of being really historically accurate. That's uh, what we all call the Oaks Garden, as Tom mentioned, which is now law, but that was the original swimming pool. So <laughs> if we wanted to be really historically accurate, we need to go back to a swimming pool. But of course, I know it's beautiful, but uh, you know, we have uh, such a major uh, source of funds as Kathleen leads all of that charge. Uh, and, and I don't think anyone's advocating going back to a swimming pool. So, you know, making this, like, 
are somewhat arbitrary and educated decisions about what's historic that's worth keeping, what was historic that probably doesn't make sense going back to, and so that we honor the needs of today, but we're also honoring the vision that the Senate of Human had. And right there, there is the Italian Garden today, 2012. Well, probably 2011, because the roses are going to be better. Um, maybe I'll change there to make it happen, but that's a, that's a different story. So, Dad and I spend a lot of time talking about, you know, when Tom is made up of many parts, so we've got these very formal gardens and grounds like you see here, and the Italian A Garden, probably for many, many, many reasons will always remain an Italian garden, and that's just what it should be. But then there's other areas of how we begin thinking about, you know, what is the right treatment for the front lawn? Everybody loves the front lawn, and we all, I think, are in agreement that the front lawn needs to remain. But, you know, as we just recently received a very generous grant to replace the front lawn, because there's so many gophers in our front lawn, and, and the gophers And, you know, what kinds of grasses do we think about? What kinds of, because water at this moment in our history is a, is a huge issue, and as a resource, it's a huge issue to think about. And the senator, um, one of his legacies he left was that he was quite instrumental during his time in the Senate in, in overseeing the process to dam Kachechi. So here's a picture of the senator at Kachechi. This was a lifelong work for me, I find it quite fascinating. There are a couple of busts on the ground that he commissioned, and there's actually a bust, if you go up the Poets Walk, of John Muir. John Muir, of course, for those of you who know some of California history, was, you know, the senator was his nemesis. <laughs> the senator was, you know, exactly in the opposite direction. But to sustain the Bay Area and the people of the Bay Area, who are most of us, it was necessary that this great game be placed here. We currently have a water system up on the side um, of our trails, up behind an old tennis court, and there's a really lovely image in the exhibition the senator used to entertain people about that water system. All of this starts lending itself to, to what kinds of choices we make in terms of the landscape. Yeah, so again, balancing History with with modern realities. As Ken mentioned, um, the senator, we, I think it's 200, you know, 275,000 gallon tank, uh, which is a fair amount of water, but we run out of that uh, about June usually. So then we have to use city water to water the grounds. So okay. That's a very expensive uh, proposition. So, like, how do we? have an appropriate landscape for this climate. You know, we have a Mediterranean climate here where it rains, it's supposed to rain six months out of the year, and it's supposed to be drought six months out of the year. Of course, this year has been more drought than rain, but uh, and developing a garden that kind of honors that type of climate is, is very doable, uh, but it may take a little bit of rethinking on our part. Now, again, no one's talking about removing it from on, that's where we, we do it, because it's such a vital, huge space, but the surrounding areas, um, I think, are open to possibilities of using more drought-resistant landscaping, uh, which also gets to the whole other issue that Senator Fido's time and story goes, he had 27 full-time gardeners here, and now there's uh, two part-timers, <laughs> and, uh, and a part that one day we kind of mow and blow through that comes in. So, I have expectations that the staff will grow, the garden staff will grow. I think we'll think positive here, but I don't think we'll ever have 27 full time gardeners again. So, how can we manage this with uh, our existing resources, develop a volunteer staff, um, and, and make it a truly vibrant, sustainable community endeavor? That's all part of that uh, conversation. So, um, I was going to read one of the other things that I kind of I don't know where to go with this, but it's part of the conversation where Senator Gillen you know, considered these as kind of his pleasure, pleasure gardens for his guests and himself, of course. But he, he also considered them a, a, a resource economically. 
And I know a quote in the, in the legacy of the Native Son, this book by uh, Jane Walsh, Tim People Keep on Mount Cabo, and Senator Ewing. And uh, he says, Ewing looked upon the property surrounding the Villa Mount Cabo principally as a pleasure garden, but it was also an economic resource to be carefully cultivated. He kept a close account of the harvest from his fruit orchards, and he directed that the servants keep a poultry yard and vegetable gardens. The produce of these could supply not only his own table, but that of his servants, and he wanted to send Montalvo's fresh berries, vegetables, and fruits to his sister and other favorites. So, you know, it's like a little hint that he actually worked the land to get some return. And I, I really think that's kind of an interesting place to look. Like, I'm not suggesting we make a farm here, but like, how can we get more of a return on the land, so to speak? In other words, we put all sorts of resources into it, water, labor. How can we maximize the return? And part of that's just having this venue for art and other activities, concert venue, uh, weddings. But I, I kind of want more out of this land. It's a, it's a tremendous resource consuming thing, so let's make it a, a return. Back to you. <laughs> so I think, you know, for me it's very interesting. The senator was very thoughtful about, about water as a resource. And he actually built this property. We have two creeks that run through the property. And we have three. One that's behind on the other side of the, the two creeks. And, and we do have one that borders our property as you enter. And um, I, I have found a lot of interest thinking about the forest, thinking about the invasive species, thinking about the areas that are a lot less cultivated. I think as Del was talking about this idea of the economic viability of the property, we used to have an old orchard, and I feel quite thankful that the decision was made to take that orchard and turn it into our service artist residency program. Because this has now been for nine years, the, the home of um, nearly 300 artists who come from all over the world to spend time at Montalvo, to spend time in what is, you know, no longer the Valley of the Hearts to Life, but Silicon Valley, and thinking about sort of progress and how we're looking forward and, and what's happening in the world. And we're hosting writers and visual artists and composers. And um, but I have a lot of artists who are coming and they're looking at, at art practice in a very different way. So I think you know, thinking about the Italian garden on the left side and, and having some very traditional sculptural works makes sense in that kind of a space. But for many of the artists who are coming here, they would prefer to sort of dive in to, I'm going to take you back. There's um, another set of studios. These are visual art studios. Again, you've got sort of a more traditional kind of sculptural approach. And this is, again, an Italian garden as this work. Um, but our artists are wanting to experiment and explore. And I think having the opportunity to have an artist residency connected to an art center that has this kind of grounds and resources. It's a public space, and and it's outside. You have this incredible opportunity to experiment, to engage people in unexpected ways. And so I have artists who are wanting to, you know, look at this amazing old tree on the front lawn. And, and this is a young artist from San Francisco, Ali Nishinasen, who put in these near um, stainless steel near pieces into the walls of the tree. So the tree is actually reflecting the world back to you, you back to you. And, and it becomes a very different way of thinking about sculpture and engaging with the environment. I um, recently, we had an artist visit from Italy, Italy um, Claudia Borgia, and she works with plastic bags. Claudia, I think we shipped home, you know, and cartons and plastic bags to her because she takes them all over the world, she uses them, repurposes them, but she just wanted to come in and sort of juxtapose this installation on the grounds made of plastic bags. And, and 
that in itself begins a whole conversation about you know who are we as a culture. And, it's, and for me, it's important that it's it's a more quiet way for people to reflect because you're in a natural environment, you're in a natural space, and to get people thinking about what in the world are they seeing, what are they looking at, what might this be. Um, our artists are also really interested in the history of the place, and and on Hollow at one point was a bird sanctuary, and this is how the senator kept it as his home, um, and it was a bird sanctuary well into the sixties and seventies. Is that correct? Yeah. Where we have catalog lists of all of the birds that were present on the site. Well, what's happening in in all sorts of areas, including our property, you know, you're losing the songbirds and then they're sort of disappearing. So Cameron Hawkinson was here this last year and built this sort of commentary on, you know, a condominium of bird houses. And this was a moment when we turned to Dell, we worked very closely with Dell to actually take the bird condominium and then develop a bird garden. So it's, it's a way that we can start cross-pollinating across the campus in terms of what we're doing and how we're engaging the public. Yeah, I think it's a fun avenue to explore uh, integrating the art in the garden with, with the gardens themselves. And this is a perfect opportunity because underneath the tree where the, the condominium was put was just basically a, kind of a weedy mess. So it was, we had the idea like let's put a bird garden. I mean, it makes sense, right? So uh, a bird garden would be planted in this case with mainly plants made in California that are selected for uh, characteristics that would attract birds in one way or another. So, for example, there is a coffee, coffee berry, which is a, a native shrub. I guess it actually does look like little coffee bean berries on there. It's a very dense shrub, so it provides cover for the birds, but also the berries they, they eat. Uh, the California, the aster right there, the California aster is blooming. That was probably in August, September, if it's restating. Um, attracts beneficial insects, which in turn attract birds. So it's kind of a secondary approach. And then the, the, the deer grass, the of deer grass there, has little seed heads, which attract little songbirds. So that, that's what a bird garden does. And you know, right now it's fairly dormant out there. It's still small, but uh, by Next summer should be very vibrant, and who knows, maybe some birds will take up residence in that, in that sculpture. But, um, yeah, I think the, the opportunities are right to kind of continue this collaborative effort. Yes? Were the bird houses designed for those specific types of birds? I really did do some work with the, um, Audubon Society Audubon. and some folks from the Audubon Society and talked about sort of what size hole a songbird would want to go into and, and what kind of space and how birds probably would never collectively gather on one tree so that's you know not intended to be the purpose but as spring is upon us or somehow upon us we're certainly watching those houses to see if any birds take nest in those spaces is that going to be there all the time? This is a temporary installation. We wanted to keep it up through a spring and, and see if it attracted birds. And, um, and I think as the master plan goes forward and we're thinking about the property and the layout of the spaces, you know, the garden quite possibly could change. Um, the bird houses could come down. But um, I've been trying to leave some room where if if the community is responding to the work and if we're feeling good about the work, that the work can have a place here for a longer amount of time. I did see two birds going in and out of the house. Oh, really? Yeah, I was watching them. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll say, I, I try, you know, again, yeah, it's always a trade off, but I try to design a garden that it can always be there so that it made sense with Pantalo, even if the sculpture goes away. I'm not saying it was stayed permanently, but you know, like the coffee berry is actually a very solid evergreen shrub that really fits well with this kind of 
plants and so there was some thought of that. Yeah. Is it an existing thing, a bird garden? Because I know butterfly gardens, but I never heard about a bird garden. Yeah. They, it's just, just, yeah, it's just along the same lines. I mean, there's a lot of overlap between a butterfly garden and a bird garden, but yeah, yeah. there's okay. the same principles. Yeah. Mm -hmm. what? So I think, you know, going forward, it's much about how, how we can work together between our various areas and, and start just enlivening and activating the property because more and more a Saturday at Montalvo is filled with people. Um, it probably always has been. But how do you engage folks to, to stay on site longer? And we're currently going through a process um, to devise a plan for our sculpture program with um, Roger Goldstein, who's the head of the public art department of the city of San Jose. And she's really taken to thinking about Montalvo with us because it is a public space, it is a public park, but it operates very different outside of the confines of a city bureaucracy. So she's got a far smaller internal bureaucracy to deal with when she's here than she does in the city. And I think a lot of our thinking is wanting to see more of the works at Montalvo be temporary, maybe long-term temporary, but temporary works as opposed to, you know, having, uh, amassing a collection. I'm not certain that that's what we're in the business of doing, and it, and it keeps the property fresh, and it keeps it sort of moving. Um, I, just, I, I thought maybe it would be interesting to just talk a little bit about because it really is sustainability. How do you maintain a garden like this um, sustainable? <laughs> and I mean, I'm talking about, apart from water, how? So I post things uh, organically, and I moved my tunnel to organics without really saying anything. But I thought that you could just talk about this publicly. Uh, because I do think it's important, um, as we have so many children come here and all that, it, it'd be nice little a PR thing to say that we're organically managed. And that means basically um, using compost in the gardens, organic fertilizers, natural pest controls. Um, and it's, the soil here is, a lot of it hasn't been worked in, in decades, so it's, a lot of it's rock hard. But one of the easiest things to do is just adding organic matter to that soil. And we've been doing a lot of that. One great thing I haven't been able to get going yet is a composting system. Um, I, I have done that in the past on large scale, several thousand cubic yards of compost. Um, but we had equipment and manpower, <laughs> both of which we don't have here yet at Mont Montalvo. But that's a, a little bit middle range goal. I mean, not even long term. It's something that's we are keeping our stuff on site. It's just not an organized composting system yet. Uh, when I got here, stuff was being hauled off in the, in the dumpster, which was expensive, and it, you know, it's, a, it's actually a potential resource of, of organic matter. So at least we're keeping it now uh, and beginning it that way. But I, there's no reason to use chemicals here. I mean, I, I, I don't know. It's kind of old school thinking. So, I mean, I approach everything with organics, and uh, I'm confident that it'll be everything's beautiful, but actually more and more vibrant than a chemical approach. I just thought I'd say something about that. Add them to. I think to add to that, well, you know, I'm almost complicated. So I've been here for four and a half years, and just from understanding what it is and how it works and how it functions, in particular for the community, but also for the community that's here and lives here. So we have the formal gardens, we have the forest, we also have the residency, which was an old orchard, but it's it's now the artist residency. Within that residency program, we have a sustainable kitchen garden. And whenever we can pull that here to think about you know that garden and how we manage it, we, we do work with volunteers from the um, Santa Clara Master Gardeners to, to manage that garden. We've been working through how you compost and how you deal with that space. Our, our last culinary fellow, and we're very honored to have a culinary fellow in our residency, um, began really pushing us to start replanting the orchard. So we're starting to think about that piece of land 
community and how it starts to do some of what Delmet and provide a resource. So we planted 20 fruit trees of various species last year. We're sort of letting them grow and mature a little to see how well we can sustain them and then to, to probably add to that another 20 or so um, in the coming couple of years. Um, so do you mind that? I'm um, with Megan on the education here. here. And we have, um, with the education programs, really begun to integrate or maybe continue to integrate the programs that kids into the grounds. And so, um, for instance, we had a winter camp that um, <coughs> the education coordinator, uh, Charlie, uh, made, uh, had the kids in John Mill's greenhouse. And so it was done on a tray. She taught them how to grow moss. She had Dell come in one morning. Lauren actually came in one day and took them on a tour of the grounds to show them the difference between modern structures and old structures. And then Dell came in one day and actually walked around the grounds and he showed them the different parts of the grounds and they sat down in the autonomy garden and just talked about things. Last summer we had a, we talked about Montago and what that means and the houses they designed were really extraordinary from six to 12 year old kids, you know, and they started talking about well, what would you have on the inside, what would you have on the outside, what do you want to look at. Um, it was really wonderful. I mean, last summer, like, we had a stream camp here, and in the middle of the day, the director of the stream camp asked for me to take the kids to see the residencies. So we went down and looked at the residences, and we walked through the garden. So they really had a sense of place. Uh, they weren't just here to study, you know, stream instruments, that was part of it, but that they really understood. The sense of place, and more and more, Kelly and I are working together to, um, you know, have the artists and residents come into the schools, and then have you know students come to here and do historical tours and see the shows, the school shows that go on, but also then take a hike and have lunch and really, really feel that this is partly you know theirs, and they're the ones who are going to inherit. Montalvo, so how do they begin to have that sense of place? So the education programs are really important to have the kids feel and understand what's here. And the fact that Del Studio Organic Gardens is really cool because it helps kids think, oh, there are ways to plant gardens that are sustainable. And so I think it really is an integrated process for everyone working together um, to think about what we're doing. So I just wanted to contribute that because it's really cool. It's, um, it takes a village, right? <laughs> I, um, so, you know, thinking about our resident arts, thinking about sort of how we're all working together to consider the property, to think about sustaining the property. A couple of years back, we had the artist, you know, Larry Weasley, um, visiting our home, which did a project with us. And, and this, you know, for me was, was an introduction of an artist who really has an kind of environmental practice and a social practice is the basis of her work. She is actually an artist who lives in New York City. She's been um, the artist in residence of the New York City Sanitation Department for about 27 years. And, and Meryl came here and wondered, what am I going to do on this property? Where am I and what am I going to do? And we were looking at issues of interdependence and how one thing is connected to another. Well, Dan North, who's here and has been a staff at Mount for about 18 years, took us for a walk because Meryl said, well, show me sort of the source of the water. And this was where she figured she would find the answer to what kind of a product she would do on site. Dan took her up the hiking trail along with me and, and he pointed out to Meryl that we actually had a pretty significant issue of sudden oak death on the property. And this was something that, you know, after Montalvo was, was reclaimed as, as a, you know, the Montalvo Association of the People of California, the county came in and began maintaining the property outside of our formal sort of boundaries. And thinking about before, well, when I arrived, you know, almost every bridge has, has fallen down and this is to no fault of the county like any place because of budgets, because of resources, you just can only maintain. I think when I arrived to Montana, the county told me they had seven rangers for like 15,000 acres of land or something. 
and who are telling the truth. So, so we now organized a project where we invited scientists down, we, we informed the community, and really began learning about what, what some of it was. The point in, in showing her work, um, this is an example of some of it on the tree, is that so many artists today are taking a different approach to their work. So this became a film. It was a public performance. We had a performance in the hillside from singing to the oaks and, and a circle in the, this room. And then we did planting up, which is in lot one, parking lot one, and there are some oaks that are not susceptible. No, it's not that, but for, it's another conversation that you and I have often. It's just about forest management and how do we think about this space and how and how do we maybe put out a request for proposal for artist groups to come in and think about our forest in different kinds of ways because it's best to lend itself a um, very different kind of platform for artists to work with. So, I, don't, I don't know if everyone knows it's a fungus that's attacking our native oaks. Um, and it's Phytophthora reborn, is the botanical or the scientific name. Um, and yeah, we, we are losing a tremendous amount of oaks. And the general consensus is there's not a whole lot we can do about it other than kind of contain it. Um, it's, so Senator Field, as we said, that this was naming orchards at one time, he apparently uh, planted, we vegetated some of this hillside, uh, which was kind of a poor thinking thing to do, um, and many of those trees grow up nicely, but again, it has not been managed, as Kelly said, how, how do we manage this kind of like, I'm talking 175 acres, so we're not talking about the gardens here, we're talking about the, kind of the wildlands. And much of what he planted has grown up, but then all sorts of other stuff has revegetated. I mean, nature's always trying to revegetate itself. So, you know, there's all sorts of interesting species growing on their own. Uh, and it's both a challenge and an opportunity. I mean, we could, I mean, the oaks would really love to have some more light, right? <laughs> there, there are some lights going away, it's being taken over by Douglas firs and bay trees, and I'm not making a judgment on that, it's just that's what's happening naturally. So we need to kind of make a decision what, what would we like to see, not only here, but in California. Do we want oak trees, or do we want Douglas firs? And we need to start managing the wildlands, which is an interesting challenge because what's What's the driving motivation of it? It's not really economic return necessarily. Although, I, we have a family cabin up in the Sierra, and I've noticed that the National Forest Lands have started uh, selectively clearing trees. In the, and I'm very sensitive to this, but it's really beautifully done. Like, it's clearly a, a very scientific approach. There are certain trees are left, younger ones, older ones, and there's certain space between all of them. They clear out a lot of the underbrush and then they chip what they cut and leave it on the ground. And after they come through it, it actually is amazingly beautiful. It's like a park land. And it, it, it would be great to kind of explore that here. Like, is that something? Can we find something that would be willing to come up here and maybe in exchange for some of the lumber they would get, they would they would clear and grind out stuff and move forward. So, yet another challenge. That, so that's an interesting uh, thing to look at with, with Montalvo. And I love the idea of including the artists in that conversation because uh, I know there's thin sculptures up on the hills. And that's when you go up on the hiking trails, it's fun to come across a sculpture kind of Andy Goldsworthy type feeling out in the middle of nowhere. And that's just another, another facet of Montalvo. Mm -hmm. I guess, you know, when I think about sort of this idea of these 175 acres and how diverse it is, it's, it's a very kind of rich, very fortunate to have this kind of a space for the arts, for our community, and, and as a resource, and as natural environments are, you know, are dwindling in many regards, it's, it's, you know, an opportunity for us to sort of keep this and make it almost a showcase for how you sustain a property like this within a community, how you really 
how you care for a force. I, I did have an artist group up there the other day, unlike any coach, but they, they were really interested in you know, the erosion happening in the hillside and, and what's happening with the others. In their opinion, and they've been doing a program, they've been spending a lot of time at the Blue Oak Preserve, which is almost exactly as the flow price across the valley from us. Um, an area that's not being hit by the center of that. And looking at the, the landscape on the hillside, for so that was really an interesting metaphor. You know, the property is 100 years old, and all these trees were planted, and now they're all sort of catching the same disease, if you will. And so it's almost like we're seeing this life cycle happen in the forest. So we found this really rich opportunity to begin thinking a little more deeply about other areas of the property. Another area of the property that I've spent a lot of time thinking about and that, that sort of brings back to some of what Ruth was saying and also to the way we work together in planning and work to work together more often is, is this space. And this is a, kind of a funny little space when you enter the property, you come in through a series of parking lots and then there's this this space that's just <laughs> little buildings and, and at the front of it near the road is, is a, a circular grove which actually if you stand center to it is it's kind of a perfect amphitheater. Um, it's called the Grove of Generosity. It was it was created to to acknowledge and honor some of the folks that helped to build up the residency. But this place for me has just wanted to be activated and it's right along the creek side. So as you can see, it's sort of coming along the edges of the creek. And, and we put together a proposal at the time that I was overseeing education to develop this as an outdoor studio area. And a studio that the artists who are visiting on public could use, a studio space that the general public could sort of drop into and orientate themselves to where they are in the tour and how they're going to navigate the property, and a studio space that the education programs could use. So, so as Ruth mentioned, we're working with Santa Clara County Office of Education, we're hoping to work with the person with Dell and start thinking about how to engage our sort of now Silicon Valley public on the property within this space. So this space has been designed. It is now funded. It will begin breaking ground in April. It should be, we have a phase one completed um, by the end of May, time for some of the things. And it's the Creekside Studio, so it's an outdoor studio space. It's intended to be a studio in the woods. It's intended to be a space for gathering in another area where we can activate the property. Um, artists can do presentations, can do projects, can have workshops. Um, all sorts of things can happen in the space. And we're really excited about it being built. Um, it's Jeffrey Miller's landscape architect who's designing the space. And he's working with his wife, Amy Chapter, who's a local visual artist who will do a large kind of flag-like shape structure. I'm excited. Well, I think it's just the general point that there's a lot happening at Montauban right now, a lot of good things. I think there was, well, I know there was a period of kind of difficult times, but uh, Mickey, who sits on our buildings and ground committee, was just saying how uh, we had a meeting yesterday, I couldn't attend, but how excited everyone is about what's happening at Montauban. This is just one of those things where Things are moving forward. Kelly mentioned the, the front lawn is going to be redone in October, uh, and we're getting plans for that drawn up as we speak. I mean, it may even slightly change the configuration to make things flow better in pathways, but uh, the fact of the matter, these are big projects that are starting to move, and then just the overall vision of the, the master plan. So I just wanted to kind of I think sometimes we're talking about all the challenges and opportunities, but a lot of stuff's happening right now, uh, which is very exciting. Well, it's, it, you know, it lends itself to the question about sustaining the landscape. There's nothing in this landscape that necessarily needed, wanted to be sustained. You know, it was a storage space for old sort of cast off fencing and, and, you know, maybe a car or two from time to time. And, and it, it's actually quite a beautiful space. It's, it's sort of 
encircled by the forest. It's an opportunity for folks who may not spend a lot of time outside. There's, you know, this new disorder called the um, nature deficit disorder of <laughs> children who just aren't going out into the environment. And I think we have an opportunity to activate this. And by activating Montalvo, that's your sustainment because you're bringing people here becomes more valuable as a resource for the community. Um, and, and we're working, Donna and I are working closely and we've put Dale in thinking about our summer sculptures and our summer projects and, and bringing artists in to experiment in the landscape in various manners. We have um, an artist coming in from New York who will be creating a story about the place and this is part and very much in the heart of her work. To be thinking a place, visiting with the community, understanding who's here, and then working with the composer to create a series of, of spots along the trail where people can understand more about the space, more about the community there. And her name is Kiana Kapoor, and she will have some sort of physical presence on the front lawn and physical presence at our lookout point, which is that on the way up the trail. Overlooks all of Silicon Valley. Um, we're working with a Brazilian artist, a, a Mexican artist from Brazil, 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 and his project is still in development, but he's thinking about very different ways of engaging the property with sculpture, and we're just sort of in this negotiation piece. And then we're working with um, a collaborative team who are local artists, Rock Massa. Us tonight, and Adrian Pap, who has been working together to create these dress tent sculptures that can be activated, animated, and this is a hot chick dress. This is just a hot chick garden dress tent. <laughs> so we've got a garden dress that will actually sit right outside of these windows. It will grow off this side of the road, edible plants really sort of bringing back to our culinary residence, bringing back to, you know, the time when there was more agriculture growing on this land. Dad is working closely with the artist to decide what kinds of foods would grow on this land, and then we're looking at creating a whole flowering bed outside. This work can be performed. A person can actually come up into the very top of it and, and activate the space, and within the space, you will have sort of mating calls. So you'll be swinging on the swing and you can make calls of, of birds and humans and songs. So you can also. So so it's playing a, it's fun, it's in a different way of starting to think about the space, who's utilizing the space. Perfect thing for the searches. Um, I'm a service fund, July 29th, so I'm a front lawn. So she's, she's actually called the edible, she's, she's saying you did that, she's the edible, edible uh, dress, dress, dress and, and she's an attractor. So it would be wonderful to work with you down and hearing um, how you did this beautiful um, garden to, to augment and bringing the birds that, that we would like her to bring in, you know. All kinds of Yeah, it's interesting. I, I've seen pictures. Some of the ones that I can the dallies out, there's a strip of lawn right next to the no, on the line, right here which is, you know, it's serviceable, but not exactly exciting. But it's hard to mow because it's on, you know, steep slope. So I always thought the dallies there. And lo and behold, that was at the bank off wider, and I saw an image in there. And I swear, it was real kind of greeny black and white image. Those are values. I mean, it's like great, great lights in the light. But anyway, when we kind of started thinking about a location for Bob's tent uh, at this area, I thought, well, you know, that is perfect because we find, since there's going to be a garden component to the piece, to have the Dahlia uh, garden next to that. So I think that's the plan for this summer. So we're going to rip that lawn out, plant dahlias, plant other climbing bars for the tent, and edibles. So yeah, it's a, it'll be a fun collaboration coming up here. So I'm looking forward to it. So 
in the one public. I think what we discovered in going through the archives and putting together the exhibition has always been a work in progress. It's always been, you know, a set of folks here deciding, you know, what what's right for one public at the time. It's always had artists coming and going from the property. I think that's part and parcel through that artistic process is you're always reconsidering, rethinking and 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 relearning sort of what what is this moment called for? What does this moment mean? And, and we're certainly thinking about all areas of the property with our artists as we think about building sculpture, as we think about you know, all of the landscapes. I think we put together this master plan and and you know certainly sustainability going forward is going to be a big part of what what's new. Question relative to sustainability, the repair of the front lawn, the future relative to, uh, for instance, uh, water, the fountain at the very end of the gardens that destroyed by the earthquake couldn't function anymore. Is it possible to restore that fountain perhaps with uh, reusable water, whatever? When that front lawn is being done, there's going to have to be a lot of additional irrigation work done. Would it be possible that that was done at the same time? Sure. In fact, I think that we, we received a grant uh, to restore the Love Temple, which is, I think, what you're talking about. Yes. Uh, and that's going to be happening shortly. So that's going to be restored. And the uh, Belvedere, which is the original kind of lookout. Classical structure, which is often part of my three, is also going to be restored. Here's, here's that. Um, so, as far as I know, there's not a plan to restore this, but there's been conversations about it. It wouldn't take very much. So, I, I would love to see that back in the time, I'm sure. But I'll put that uh, on the front burner. How about that? <laughs> because, yeah, the, I think it's a fun opportunity. There's already water down there, so there's no major. It's just getting a, a recirculating pump system in there. Since the whole building's going to be refurbished re anyway, it's a perfect opportunity to do that kind of work. It's another part of what's happening right at this moment. We've been, the county's awarded the grant and it would be to renovate this engine. It was here quick in 85, especially this kind of work. And in mind, they did such significant damage to that space. Um, so we're just doing all areas. Everything's I mean, as we're talking, it's just kind of randomly interesting how there's such a classic, classical component here in the history. There's such a kind of cutting edge art program. And then we have kind of a wild, the, uh, just a native areas. And so you've got three distinct but very closely interrelated uh, opportunities here. And I think, I think that's really probably unique to uh, any art center. I, I don't know. But, uh, and it's such a great opportunity for a table here. So. Well, it's quite unique. It also comes with its own set of built-in challenges yes. because it, it means that people are attracted to Montalvo for their gardens and their historic nature of the property <coughs> and, and where contemporary art fits in that conversation you know, is not exactly clear and there are people who come here simply to hike in the forest and, and use it as a place to exercise and keep themselves well and healthy and, and how you know this historic property or the arts fit in and then there's clearly folks who are coming here simply for the artistic program and for what's happening there. And, and we might as well, you know, just take over the rest of the project. So, so it's a balancing and it's a juggling, I think, between the various programmatic areas. This is what we're, we're struggling with and how to really make one public something special and, and keep it on this trajectory. We enter through this next century. Questions? You, you, you ask. <laughs> <laughs> you, 
very plebeian question relative to money. Over a hundred acres, or certainly the overwhelming amount of the acreage, is in the park, hoping that there would be some public funding to keep up that while the funding for Montalvo is utilized for the immediate acreage. Your comments earlier indicated that you're really concerned about the overall impact as far as those other acres are concerned to the Oak Death Syndrome, etc. How do you fund that approach? Is there money being allocated for that or is it down the way a little bit? Well, there's definitely a prioritizing and that kind of sadly in my mind that yeah, it's going to be a lower priority. I think including it in the conversation though attracts interest and I mean, I, we have a couple of people that are really passionate about trying to prevent set note death. And you never know, they, they may find or, or spur at least some recognition of that. So, yeah, I, I kind of figure if you don't ever talk about it, nothing's ever going to happen. If you do talk about it, maybe, like the law, I mean, is a great example. A, a year and a half ago, thinking of redoing that law was just ludicrous. But here we are, and this very large grant to do it. And even the master plan, I had to kind of give a little hooray because I brought that up. You know, part of my thing, I think, like, all, we need a master plan here. But then when I got here, is like, I realized that like, we really need uh, landscape architecture, which is a very complicated technical field. It's different than what I do. Because right? you're talking about traffic patterns and parking lots and grades, and, you know, it's so. I said, look, we need a landscape architect. And most people didn't know what that meant, much less, and then I also got comments like, well, we don't have money for that. Well, guess what? We did it. You know, <laughs> we got the money, we got grants. So I'm, I'm, I'm not, well, maybe I am a little dreamy, but I think if you talk about it and <laughs> raise awareness, you can all be dreamy. You can all be dreamy. Talk is cheap, and uh, you know you never know. I, I do think there could be collaborative efforts, not necessarily with county because they're so broke. But, but you know you never know. Maybe there'd be some kind of grant out there. Mm -hmm. I mean, this fire rate could be a good argument for for managing. You know, the entire Saratoga could go up and smoke because it's a pretty big chunk of land here. And if we could argue that, you know, that might be a facet to look at. So I also think. You, you know, there, there is no money allocated to care for the force unless it's some kind of emergency situation that the county can't get out to do. The county's been paying a lot of attention to us lately. We've been up here um, taking down some dead trees and things that are hazardous. But, you know, I also think there's opportunities through the arts and, and, and in some kind of a collaboration with the arts and sciences. We've had the dean of uh, um, the arts school Lucy Sanders come up and very interested in, in doing some collaboration with artists thinking about ecology, thinking about the environment, and we've got that talent for an artist to work with me. Um, and again, this is not a traditional sculpture, but a very different sort of creative way of thinking. I might mention that we just finished a climate clock um, ideas competition, and the climate clock was, was a project that Montalvo worked with UC Santa, or excuse me, University San Jose State University and the San Jose Public Art Department um, to put together this ideas competition, house artists and scientists um, in collaborative teams for a year to come up with a monumental piece of public art for the city of San Jose that would track data on climate change. And, and have a feedback mechanism so it can act as, as an educational tool as well as, as a um, to promote the city. And these ideas um, were dreamed up much in our residency and, and within our grounds. And they last week came together, they selected the finalists, mm -hmm. and, and it's just an interesting idea. Uh, one of the teams has mapped out in this region where all of the bioindicators are being collected and how we been thinking about this. Um, so, so I think you know, through these kinds of 
projects and artistic investigation, there is a possibility as well. Who has chosen? I'm curious. I'm not sure that I can say. Oh, yeah. <laughs> 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 it, I don't think it's been made public, so I shouldn't say anymore. But you know. <laughs> Yes. I think I have a question for you, Del. Yeah. Let's we'll see if it turns out that it's a question. I was looking at the, the, the slide of the sudden object, and I started thinking about your, your background with biodynamic farming and with um, sustainable practices. And I just started to wonder in some way you know, if you also view that as a, a natural, as disease in nature, as a natural process. And then I started thinking, well, if you did, if you if you do feel that way, what are the, you know, like some of the guiding principles for your long-term, you know, vision when thinking about these three different, you know, components? Yeah, I, um, I approach gardens and health <laughs> as a, a holistic kind of approach. So just a brief background and organic approaches to uh, maintaining the land. Plants um, get sick, they get diseases, they get pests, but why do they do that? Um, and this relates to human health. Why do we all get sick? We have these immune systems that keep us healthy, but some of us get sick and some of us don't. That's a hugely complicated question. And you know, there's a tremendous amount of research and history on that. But it is known that plants can be boosted so they don't get sick overall. In fact, it's interesting that crops that get bugs um, actually give off infrared rays so that uh, the antenna on insects are not really that they actually pick up those infrared rays. So it's like nature saying, like, I'm sick, get rid of me, because I, I, I need to be getting rid of it. It's really tricky. So we spray chemicals on those crops to keep them alive, So and then we eat those. So we're basically eating crops that are wanting to die. <laughs> it's a truth. So this is Dr. Phil Callahan. He's this interesting scientist who discovered this fact. So those relate to uh, the health of the plant relates with sugars in the plants, all the carbohydrates. And when sugars are high in the plants, like really vigorous, the plants are like, I'm cool, you know, leave me alone. Like, it's like it, the plant's immune system. And the insects won't bother those in general. Really interesting thing. So, taking that approach, like, why are these trees getting sick all of a sudden? And, you know, I'm not going to claim to know anything because there's a tremendous amount of science. Uh, we have Dr. Robert Hepton is his name. You see Berkeley professor who I have heard speak and tremendously, tremendously knowledgeable. Uh, he could talk a lot about this, but he's approaching it from like we have a pathogen, there's not much we can do about it, we just need to contain that pathogen. But I would say we don't have a whole lot to lose. Just try to make another approach, or at least try an approach of saying, well, maybe those trees are sick for certain reasons. Um, one of those theories that's presented is by a gentleman, uh, Dr. Lee Klinger. Uh, he has this organization called SevenOakLife.org. Mm -hmm. And uh, his theory, which others have had in the 1980s, because Europe started losing lots of air force due to acid rain, is the acidification of soil and, and the surrounding growth of the plant. So in other words, Native Americans used to burn the land frequently to, to maintain kind of clearing uh, and promote certain things like oak trees. So if you, and by burning you alkalinize the soil each time you burn. So we kind of said no burning, let's stop burning. And of course now in the wildfire it's going to just giant conflagration, you know, just all. Because there's so much built up organic matter. Uh, that organic matter acidifies, lowers the pH of the soil over time. Fairly dramatically. 
And not only that, as other things like the bay trees and the feathers birds, once shade tops, tree, uh, species start to grow up, mosses start to form on the trunks of the oak trees, which mosses are incredibly acid too. So you, the, the tree itself is just surrounded by this super acidic atmosphere. Now, if any of you are in holistic health, they say that if you get a, a acid in your system, you're much more prone to disease. So the same thing with a plant. It's more acidic, it's more prone to disease. So an approach is we can't burn anymore uh, because you know we're surrounded by civilization. But he, uh, this doctor Cleaner does something called fire mimicry, which is basically you put an alkaline material around the base of the tree and it could be like around with oyster shells um, or some calcium source. Uh, and then he also uses something called azomite, which is a ground up mineral. And um, he also literally power washes the trunk of the trees if they're covered in moss. Uh, and then even what, you know, the old fashioned whitewash with the orchard trees, it's that, it's like an alkaline material. And he's been able to uh, revive certain oaks that kind of come near death. And also, as a, it's more effective as a preventative. You know, the tree's really far gone, I'm not saying that would work, but as a preventative, and even if trees just kind of start to go, you can at least salvage those trees. And I figure even that it doesn't work, you're really not out anything, because the other alternative is Dr. Um, Dr. Levin says, which is kind of a world authority, it's like, nothing you can do. So I'd rather try some of this stuff, and we've actually started a little experimental stuff here. Uh, I worked at this private city Woodside for 20 years. We cleared about 100 acres. I mean, uh, opened up, pruned, painted certain key oaks with these minerals, and uh, we had no sediment down. So, not claiming anything. I just think it's worth exploration. I, I agree. I mean, that's very interesting to me is how you sort of test these theories and, and try to. The residency is fortunate enough to have kept the old sort of heritage oaks on site. So we are testing this theory. You know, is it possible? Because we can't, we're not going to spray these trees because we don't have you know, the financial resources to put to spraying every oak on our, so, how, so we're trying to be clear and, and, and take Dell's advice and, and test this theory. So. <laughs> Thank you for being here. Our next chit chat is through the level. Oh, the chit Yes, here we go. The 11th of March, that is April 2nd, and also the team will be here speaking with Tom O'Leary about activating the ground with the arms and Pamela. We don't know the work in the performance of a local and a composer from the city. So, really trying to sort of stretch the idea of what a program parks on the ground looks like. Um,